the sun rises over KwaZulu-Natal for the final day of the Rally South Africa. The day that will not only decide who will win the event, but the day that will in all probability set the tone for the championship fight that will have to be settled over the next few months. The Rally South Africa moves further inland to the forest and plantations in and around the Richmond area west of Peter Maritzburg. These roads haven't been used for rallying since early 2007, but they are dauntingly fast and will provide a tough test of bravery and driving skills. As overnight rally leader, Mark Ronier will have to play road sweeper. So, can he stay ahead of Gemmel? I think I can. I've got a good car underneath me. Uh, we saw yesterday that the car felt really, really good. Or will Gemmel be able to chase his rival down? Well, that's the plan, eh? This is quite a long stage, so we'll see after this one how we do it. It's been a while since Enzo Kuhn has found himself in the top three. Will he be happy to hold station, or does he have ambitions to challenge for the lead? Uh, we're taking a big step, like you see with the car, so we're closer. Unfortunately for Kuhn and Volkswagen, they'll have no more help from BP Volkswagen teammate Hans Weiss, as the Flying Dutchman was forced to retire from the rally. Yeah, engine explodes, so it's finished. Off to stage five then, a full 32 kilometers in distance. But don't expect the drivers to take too long to reach the end, as the average speeds will be furious. If Mark Lunier and Robin Houghton want to win the Rally South Africa, they will have to do it while sweeping from first on the road. But this did not appear to distract the Sassel Fiesta driver at all. Kronje flew over the flying finish just 19 minutes and 31 seconds after starting the long 32 kilometer stage. Johnny Gemmel and Carolyn Swan now had it all to do. Gemmel is renowned for his ability to chase his rivals down on day two and with a slightly better road position everyone was expecting the Castle Toyota to close the gap on the first stage of the day. But no, his time is 19 minutes and 39 seconds. Gemmel loses another 8 seconds to Cronje. Time for Enzo Keen and Guy Hodgson to formulate their plans for the day. The BP Volkswagen Polo was probably too far back to challenge for a victory, so Keen opted to try and protect his current third position. His time of 20 minutes exactly was however somewhat slow and only good enough for sixth on the stage. The mapping on the car has really gone off, so it's very difficult to drive. With the demise of Hans Weiss before the start of the day's first stage, John Williams and Kubis Frey were gifted a position when they climbed from fifth to fourth. But the Sassel driver now also had Keane's third position in his sights. On stage five, he managed to beat Keane's time, but only by three seconds. It's right five in. Right six, left five, right six, left five, into right nine. It's it's interesting to wake up and have to push so hard over 35 k's. I think the lowest gear we went to was third gear. It's pretty much flat out. Hein Latergan and Johan van der Merwe had ambitions of improving on their overnight sixth position overall. But the SAC Trucks Peugeot driver also had to keep an eye out for his very own son, who started the day just 2.2 seconds behind. Latergan Senior took just 20 minutes and 1 seconds to complete the fast stage 5. But behind him on the road, his 18-year-old son showed no respect for his father or the Q8 Wills Volkswagen Polo as he went 2.5 seconds faster to overtake his dad on the overall leaderboard. <laughs> Jan Habich and Robert Paisley started day 2 in an unaccustomed 8th position overall. Something which would not have pleased the man who has been rallying for nearly three decades. These Basel re-technicians were able to adjust the Fiesta's handling to be more to his liking. And it showed, as he set the third fastest time of all, to rocket himself from eighth to fifth on the overall standings in just one stage. The names Gugu Zulu and Carl Peskin were now becoming a regular feature in the top ten on most rallies. And the Rally South Africa was no different. Zulu set the ninth fastest time on the day's opening stage and moved into eighth position overall. Fast flowing stage, but we're not quick enough and uh, yeah, struggling with a bit of setup. Shaw Wilkin and Etienne Lawrence were still getting used to their new relationship inside the Basel V and Visav sponsored Fiesta. And early on during stage five, their skills were to be even further tested when the intercom system failed. <laughs> No 
Lorenz proved to be a resourceful navigator and turned to using hand signals. Now by the fourth corner, the intercom just stopped working. I know, it's the whole stage without the intercom. Wilken was still in the top 10, but Geniel de Villiers and also new co-driver Les Sneders were now just 26 seconds behind Wilken's 10th position in their Imperial Toyota Auras. After a slow start, team totals Mohamed Moussa and Andre Vermeulen also decided that this was the time to put the hammer down. Moussa is an extremely quick driver when the chips fall right, but so far in 2012 they haven't, something which the businessman is hoping to change. Musa was now ahead of the PZN panel beaters Toyota of Namibians Volvo Dippenar and Morne de Toy, who in turn was leading the Monster Energy Ford Fiesta of Sebastian Klaassen and Cindy Hardy. So, here are the standings after the first stage of day two. Mark Cornier extends his lead over Johnny Gemmel to a full 21 seconds, with Kuhn in a comfortable third. Williams is in fourth, but now under severe pressure from a charging Jan Harbeck. Only two tenths of a second separate son and father Henk and Hein Lartekhan, while the names of Zulu, Vulcan and de Villiers round off the top ten. The Dunlop service park on the outskirts of Richmond provides the first chance of day two to attend to the rally machines, while drivers can regroup and focus on the tough few stages still ahead. Mark Cornier just extended his lead over arch rival Johnny Gemmel. It was quite nerve-wracking up front because you sort of just don't know how to how hard to push and there's a lot of blind crests and you're not sure what's on the other side. I mean, we did the recce, but you're still not that 100% confident. The fact that Cronier edges further ahead means that Gemmel finds himself further behind. Yeah, he had a good stage, obviously. I think he got eight seconds quicker than us, so that uh, was pretty good. It was a nice stage there. Jan Habich had a slow start to the event, but the master was on a mission to see how far up the leaderboard he could go. Just, I think we're just trying to find the right speed to do what we can do, and it's probably sort of get close to third. And just two tenths of a second is all that separates Henk and Hein Lartekhan, but with the advantage in the favour of the youngster. Yeah, but it's, it's very close, and I know my dad's really quick, so um, I think I'll we'll see you through the next day for that. If there are any questions as to what will happen at the Rally of South Africa, Stages 6 and 7 will provide most of the answers. Stage 6 is a flat-out affair on wide sugarcane-type roads, while Stage 7 returns to the plantations and is more technical. But together, these two stages account for 46 kilometers of gravel road racing, and that without the chance to service the cars in between. And as with so many times before, the Rally South Africa was now turning into a two-horse race between Mark Lanier and Robin Houghton and Johnny Gemmel and Carolyn Swan. Lanier started stage six with a 21-second advantage over Gemmel, but he obviously felt that it wasn't time to sit back just yet. The Sassel fought first across the flying finish in a time of just 14 minutes and 9 seconds for an average speed of well over 140 kilometers an hour, that on the dirt road. Yeah, it's pretty much on the limit to most of the way. The Castrol Toyota orders of Johnny Gimmel and Callan Swan was not much slower, taking only four seconds longer to complete the same 34 kilometers. But another four seconds lost meant that Tonya's lead increased from 21 to 25 seconds. Yeah. Ah, we just have to keep going, eh? See? Enzo Keen and Guy Hodgson had given up on the leaders and were probably happy with their current third position. But they now had a charging John Williams and Jan Hobby closing in on the BP Polo. We're doing our best. We're giving it uh, a full go and we really kept the foot in on that stage. So. Williams and co-driver Kubis Frey had Keen firmly in their sights. But close to the end of the fast stage six, something was wrong and forced them to stop. After more than 10 agonizing minutes, Williams and the Sassel Fiesta got going again, but his hopes of challenging for a podium position had all disappeared. Yeah, we just came around a very fast corner with a bit of rock and wire, so one of those things. This was exactly the gap that Jan Habich and Robert Paisley were hoping for. Habich was now in a charge and set the third fastest time of all in stage six. 
More importantly, for the Basel Lead 4 driver, he managed to beat Team's time by 9 full seconds and was now just 13 seconds from third position. Well, let's see the time is great. Behind the battle between Keen and Habig for the final podium position, a family feud was raging between 18-year-old Henk Latergan and his somewhat more experienced father Hein. The latter started the fast stage 6 with a 0.2 second deficit, but will his time be fast enough to pass his son? Being a dad, I'm not, I don't think it's good if he goes faster because you will start to worry about it. The word fear does not exist in a schoolboy's vocabulary and young Henk Latergan obviously has never heard of it either as he simply kept his foot flat at over 170 kilometers an hour and extended his advantage over his father by another 1.6 seconds. That was scary. <laughs> no, it's a very fast stage. It's full commitment. You need. It's scary. Eh? Still the final day of the Rally South Africa, where Mark Ronier has managed to open up what is starting to look like a comfortable gap of the current championship leader, Johnny Gemmel, with a number of just as fierce battles raging on behind the leaders. With 17 Super 2000 four-wheel drive rally machines taking the starters orders the day before, and 14 of them still running, time was running out for South Africa's top drivers to jockey for their final positions. Team Total's Mohamed Moussa and Andre Vermeulen have seen the ugly side of Lady Luck far too many times so far in the 2012 season as they very rarely got past stage one. This time, however, Moussa did make it into day two of an event, but once again, he was destined not to reach the end as a parked rally car on the side of the road is never a good sign. Well, coming out of the gearbox and when that normally happens and you've driven a little bit of a distance, then you start to worry, so... Class S2000 challenge points leaders Gugu Zulu and Carl Peskin were somewhat behind their main class rivals Henk Latergan, but second in class would still be more than enough for the BP Polo driver to keep his class lead intact. Zulu was also running well inside the top 10, but it took nearly 10 minutes longer than his rivals to reach the end of stage 6. Uh, we had a puncher halfway through the stage and uh, you know without even having a ratchet gun we, we had to use a normal wheel spanner so we lost incremental amount of times. This loop of stages proved to be the undoing of many teams. Besides Musa, Zulu and John Williams early on, Shaul Wilkin became another driver to run into trouble. The Basel Reed Fiesta driver and his standing but experienced co-driver Etienne Lawrence now also had a puncture and dropped from 9th to 13th. One of those rallies, puncture in the stage. So. Someone with a clean run so far was Geniel de Villiers and his new co-driver Celeste Sneders. De Villiers had a slow and cautious start to the event, but after getting some stage distance behind him and the Imperial Toyota Aurus, the former Dakar rally winner was getting more and more comfortable as he slowly climbed his way up the leaderboard to finish this loop of stages in a very credible seventh position overall. It's quite tricky, you know, I must say I'm, I'm, I'm battling a bit with the fives and the sixes at the moment, you know, just to really have the confidence to attack them 100%. Uh, Rallying is all about speed, but it has to be matched with the ability to finish. When a number of drivers ran into trouble like they did halfway through the final day of the Rally South Africa, it opens the door for other drivers to climb the ranks and the leaderboard. Sebastian Klaassen and experienced co-driver Cindy Harding did not make any mistakes in their Monster Energy Ford and were rewarded with ninth on the leaderboard at this stage of the event. <laughs> Namibians, Volo Dippenard and Morne de Tue were just as consistent, but even faster as they climbed to eighth in the PZ in panel beaters Toyota. Like Latigan Jr. and Gugazulu, Dippenard is also contesting the Super 2000 Challenge class for older generation S2000s used by the factory teams in previous seasons. And with the Zulu losing time, Dippenard was now not only in the overall top 10, but also second in the S2000 Challenge class. But at the sharp end of the field, however, we still had three individual battles raging with the top six points scoring positions still at stake. Henk Latergan was leading his father by less than two seconds going into stage seven. And clearly, the youngster ignored all family orders as he set the third fastest time of all on stage seven. 
that Q8 Oil's Volkswagen Polo increased his lead over the SAC truck's Perso of his father by another full five seconds. Ahead of the Latigan clan, Jan Habig and Robert Paisley in the Basel Reed Ford Fiesta were closing in on third place BP Volkswagen Polo of Enzo Keen and Guy Hodgson. Between these two drivers and former teammates, they have won a total of eight South African Rally Championships and countless rallies. So there is absolutely no love lost when it comes to this battle for the final podium position. Keen had a 13 second advantage over Habig, but the Volkswagen driver lost time on the stage and Habig takes over third position. Seven in, right seven in, into tight right six. The seven here opens to a right six tight. Lost a valuable time. Time we don't have. <laughs> Ahead of Habi and Keen, Johnny Kemmel and Kellen Swan were now running out of time to try and do anything to unsettle Mark Lonier and Robin Houghton. The gap between the Castle Toyota in second and the Cecil Ford in the lead was now a full 25 seconds. Gemmel has worked miracles before in his long career, but so has Mark Lonier, and the younger of the two pretenders did not show any cracks. In fact, the Cecil Ford recorded its fifth stage victory of the event to extend his lead over Gemmel to a full 32 seconds. Into Metra 2 in. Here's proof of how Mark Cronier dominates the field with a 32 second advantage over Johnny Gemmel. The final podium position changes hands with Harvey and now ahead of Kuhn, while young Henk Lauter de Villiers moves up to seven ahead of Namibian Vilro Dippenar and Sebastian Klaassen, while Chad Conradi in a Super 1600 front-wheel drive car rounds off the top 10. This is the last opportunity to service the severely abused rally cars in the Dunlop service park. Only one long dirt stage remains before the crews will head back to Durban for the final showdown on tar. Enzo Kuhn was on course for his best result of 2012, but a mistake on the previous stage sees him trailing Hobbit by 8 seconds. We're in a big fight at the moment and we have been <laughs> all day. Uh, it's quite challenging because I think we've, although we've taken a step with the car in terms of reliability, the, we still don't have the speed, so we're really pushing very hard inside the car. On the other hand, Hobby set out on day two to reach the podium and with only one real stage to go, finds himself in third overall. I think uh, up until now we've achieved what we set out to do. Not much more we can do, I think, on this rally. At the top, Johnny Gemmel was wondering if there was anything more he could do. Yeah, it's a little bit far. Yeah, around 40 seconds and 38 k's. But uh, we'll still go ahead and give it a go in there and see. With a more than half a minute lead, chances are that Marc Cronier has sealed another victory. Well, it's never over till it's over, you know, so we've got a 30k stage coming up now and I think it's absolutely vital that we stay focused. And this is the final gravel battlefield. 32 kilometers of fast gravel roads make stage 8 the last real opportunity for any of the protagonists to try and influence the outcome. After stage 8, the crews will head back to Durban for a final short showdown on tarmac and in front of large crowds. But the rally itself will most probably be won or lost in the forests of Richmond. BP Volkswagen's Hergen Fekken and Pierre Aris did not even make it to stage one of the rally South Africa the day before. But the Volkswagen technicians repaired the polo, allowing him to run the stages of day two under the super rally rules. Fekken used the opportunity to further test the car and the fastest stage time of all on the long and fast stage 8 would have been very encouraging for the future. Gugu Zulu and Carl Peskin were running well inside the top 10 early on, but a dreaded puncture prevented the talented driver to fight for a better position. The BP Polo driver had no choice but to settle for a lonely 15th. Ahead of Zulu, John Williams and Kubis Frey suffered the same fate. The young Cape Tonian was robbed of any chance to fight for a better result when a barbed wire fence got tangled in the right rear wheel of the Cecil Ford Fiesta. But he fought back bravely to record the third fastest time of all on the last gravel stage. But it was only good enough for 13th place overall. Yeah, well maybe all the frustration after the puncture and losing the time. But maybe that time is dry from now on. So. <laughs>
The battle for front-wheel drive the Super 1600 honors was also a battle for the final spot in the overall top 10. Chad Conradi and Case Naidu emerged from the Richmond Forests with a slender 0.6 second lead over rivals Clint Weston and Herman Grunewald. A short one kilometer spectator stage very rarely decide a battle like this one. But in a fight this close, one kilometer was all it took. The reef tankers a Citroen of Weston crossed the flying finish just one second earlier than the Galvedip Toyota orders of Conradi to take 10th position overall, as well as the victory in the Super 1600 class by just four tenths of a second. Ahead of the fierce Super 1600 fight, Sebastian Klaassen and Cindy Harding managed to reach the end of the gravel stages as well as the finish in Durban to record yet another finish. Ninth overall for the Monster Energy Ford Fiesta. Charles Wilkin and Inken Lawrence experienced an eventful time behind the wheel of their Basel lead and Bizarre sponsored Ford Fiesta. Following a puncture and time lost on the previous stage, Wilkin was weighed down in 12th but managed to claw his way back up to 8th overall with Etienne Lorenz doing a good job of standing in for the absent Greg Godrich in the co-driver's seat. Ahead of Wilken, Volro Dippenard acquitted himself well as he and Mornay the Tour got to grips with their first outing in the Zululand Rally Roads which are very different to the Namibian gravel roads that they are used to. The youngster reached the end in Durban in a very fine 7th position overall behind the wheel of his PZN panel beaters Toyota. And what a comeback on day 2 by Imperial Toyota's Geniel de Villiers and new navigator Celeste Snaders. De Villiers is a very clever driver, as he has shown by winning the Dakar Rally, and used his head to build up speed without taking any risks. He was rewarded with his best ever result in a round of the South African Rally Championship in 5th. In the war of the Latigans, Father Hein Latigan had to go around 7 seconds faster than his son Hink on the long stage 8 to prevent the youngster from beating his father. Halfway through the stage, it is too close to call, but no, Hink makes a mistake, the Q8 Alls Volkswagen Polo grinds to a halt, it's the end of his run. And out on the open road, the Latigan saga continues as late drama also sees Father Hein parked on the side of the road with an overheating SAC trucks version. Latigan Senior did some roadside repairs and managed to reach Durban. Paddy was forced to take a lateness penalty, dropping him from 5th to 6th on the overall standings. What drama for the Latigan family. And what drama could possibly still be in store in the battle for the final podium position. Enzo Keen had to beat his old nemesis Jan Habich by a full 9 seconds to reclaim his former 3rd place. But Habich is a wily old fox and knows better than most how to cope with pressure. The Basel Reed Ford Fiesta beat the BP Polo by another 8 seconds to ensure yet another podium position, forcing Keane to settle for 4th. With all the other positions basically finalized, the question of who would win the Rally South Africa still had to be answered. The contenders were Johnny Gemmel and Callum Swan in the Castle Toyota, and Mark Lonier and Robin Houghton in the Sassel Ford Fiesta. But Cronje had a healthy lead of more than half a minute and for the first time in the entire event Cronje eased off as he made sure that he reached the end of the long gravel stage without taking any risks whatsoever. Gemmel on the other hand was pushing hard as always and although he managed to close the gap to Cronje's lead by a full 10 seconds it was still not enough. This is the final one kilometer that stands between Mark Cronje and his third victory of 2012. And try as he may, it's unlikely that Johnny Gemmel can change that. Cronier is simply in a class of his own. He proves to yet another stage and a rally South Africa victory. Enzo Kuhn gave it one last shot to try and reach the podium. But the gap to Jan Habich was also too big and Habich claimed the points for third position. A dominating performance from Marc Cronier sees him take the victory by 24 seconds from Johnny Gemmel. Jan Habich grabs another podium ahead of Kuhn and de Villiers. Latikhan Senior drops to sixth, while his son Henk disappears from the leaderboard, handing the S2000 Challenge victory to Vilro Dippenar. Wilken salvages a few points for eighth ahead of Klaassen and the Super 1600 winner Clint Weston, who completes the top ten. Veteran Jan Habich records yet another podium position in his long and distinguished career. The best we could do was finish third and uh, that was the objective. 
So I think we, uh, we achieved our objective, but it wasn't really a, a very good rally for us. Johnny Gimmel's second place finish also drops him to second in the overall championship standings. That's no, close. Eh? It's been close since the first rally this year, and um, next two, three events uh, can change, so we'll just keep going, eh? But three wins out of five in 2012 hands the championship lead back to Mark Cronier, who was in devastating form on the Rally South Africa. Yeah, our winning's always sweet, and I think uh, coming to this event, we, we put in a lot of effort, and uh, it feels good to be on top of the podium again, because it, it was a hard road. I mean, coming back from two events, we had two tough events, and it uh, really feels good.